15 years ago, you never heard of a foreign company winning in, a, in, a, in an Asian court against a local company. I'm here to tell you that I'm, I'm eight out of 10 in court cases where a foreign company against, in this case, a, a Chinese seller won in a Chinese court of law mainly because we follow the tips that we're going to talk about today in terms of contract, local language, the right jurisdiction. But just to show you how much things have changed in the last five years. So China joins the World Trade Organization 15 years ago. They're committed to you know, more transparent, a, a more legal, a, a level playing field. And China knew that they were getting a black eye, that China Inc. was losing business because foreign buyers didn't trust the legal system. They didn't think a contract would protect them. So, you know, unofficially, word comes down from Beijing to the, to the court systems, you know, let, let's uh, level up this playing field. So I've got a situation where I paid a deposit to a supplier, and he just didn't ship. He thought, hey, this foreigner is not going to take him to court. And it was only like $20,000, but for me, that was a lot of money because it was early on in my career. So I go down to the courts, and uh, very polite, um, I studied Chinese for a while, so I said to the girl, the, the clerk at the front desk, I'm thinking about suing a, a Chinese company. Here's, um, here's the case notes. What are the steps involved? And the judge, I didn't know who he was, but he was walking by the desk, and he heard me speaking Chinese, and he said, hey, bring that guy back here. So I sit in, I'm sitting down with the judge, and I explain my situation. He's like, Mike, let me make a few calls. He called the supplier and said, I've been talking to Mike. He's got a good case. If this comes to court, you're going to lose. So why don't, why don't you just pay him back now and, and save me some time? So uh, the, the judge went out of his way to protect me in China. I mean, that's illegal in America, but uh, it certainly wouldn't happen here in Australia. So we, we talk about a level playing field. Sometimes it's an unlevel playing field to your advantage as a foreigner. So don't use the excuse, oh, contracts don't mean anything in Asia. The judge will never give money or reward a foreign party. Surprisingly, it's not true. The other beauty of um, lower labor costs in Asia is that legal fees are lower. You know, I kind of feel like uh, O.J. Simpson organizing the Dream Team. When I go into a court case in China, I've got experts, I've got multiple lawyers advising me, all for a fraction of what it would cost for an, uh, a European, American, or Australian court, court case. So you can actually issue demand letters for a couple hundred bucks. You can take a, a Chinese company to court in Hong Kong or mainland China for a few thousand uh, Australian dollars. So as long as your contracts are in place and you've got clear payment trail, you can actually be victorious in a Asian court of law. So that's some good news. Now let's talk about how to protect yourself so God forbid it does go to court. Or more importantly, you don't want it to go to court. You want to use the contract to set the framework the relationship, define it, think of it as a memo of understanding so that the supplier knows what you're all about and less likely to break it. Okay, contracts, you know, service agreement, these are very uh, broad terms. When we say contract, some of you might be thinking purchase order, some of you might be thinking non-compete clause, non-disclosure agreement. For, for the sake of this presentation, let's just say anything that's a binding document under signature from both parties. So technically, a purchase order usually defines how many units, what's the price, what are the INCO terms, where it's shipping to. You know, it's usually one page document. In Australia, you, you, when you buy from an Australian supplier or sell to your Australian customers, your contract is the purchase order. Because if anything, if any of the terms are broken, there's an implied warranty. You have legal exposure if you do things wrong, like don't refund money if you fail to ship. So because in Australia there's a legal system to protect you, you don't need as a buyer or seller in Australia to have a long T&C, term and condition sheet. But when you're buying from Asia, you don't have that well-defined um, legal exposure for the seller, so it's your job as the buyer to specify what's in the terms and conditions. So I often place a purchase order and then attached to it is a four or five page document that, that describes things about you know, my uh, vendor um, standards, code of conduct, if you will, what are the penalties for mislead times, my quality control specifications in great detail, a non-compete clause, and many even large professional buyers might issue the 
terms and conditions the contract one time and then place a purchase order with, e with each shipment. I actually go the other way around since I've made the effort to create the terms and conditions that are with the purchase order, I actually send the purchase order and the terms and conditions each time so that the supplier can't say, oh, I forgot about that clause for non-compete. So if you've got it, you know, send the paperwork each time so that there's no, um, you don't give the supplier the chance to say, oh, I forgot about those key terms. Because sometimes they're not trying to trick you, they just forgot about it. So every time I send a purchase order, the, the supplier also adds their signature and their chop to the non-disclosure agreement as well as the penalty clauses, things like that. So my point in red is if you're going to go through the process of setting these all up, bundle it together and make it into a purchase order package, if you will. The good news is you know, a, a bilingual contract in China, um, you can find an English-speaking lawyer, Chinese lawyer. I think the, the um, I'm on the board of advisors with a law firm called Asia Bridge and China Bridge, and they charge maybe 400 US dollars to draft a tailor-made contract that's bilingual. So there's really no excuse for not having a bilingual contract. These are the hallmarks of a, of a good contract. Um, you've, first hallmark, you've got the contract with the right party. You would not believe how many buyers, um, especially if you're a new buyer, play, think you're doing business with a factory you pay the money to their trading company in Hong Kong and you've got a contract with an agent or a broker. No one really set out to cheat each other, but then if you need to drag somebody into court, what will inevitably happen is you think that you're taking the manufacturer to court, the judge brings them in and uh, the manufacturer says, yeah, we've, we've got a purchase order from this Australian buyer, but we never received any funds. And you say, wait, I sent the funds to this account. Well, that's a different company, that's in Hong Kong. And then you drag the Hong Kong company into the court and they say, yeah, we received these funds from Australia, we don't have a matching purchase order, we didn't know where they came from, we've already spent the money. You know, you, and then how do, you, how do you connect the dots? You can't. So my suggestion that I'll repeat over and over again is make sure that the name on the contract in local language matches the bank account name ideally matches the name on the factory door or the agency that you're using, whatever. So if those three are the same, then your contract is going to have muscle. Um, so as I mentioned, some other hallmarks of a good contract, it's readable. You know, don't, don't let the, your local lawyer in, in Sydney tell you about this 50-page watertight contract. It might not even get read. So you know, break it down. Think of it as a memo of understanding. Get it four pages or less. And when I talk about being bilingual, I don't have it like two pages English, two pages Chinese. What I would do is a, like a paragraph or a couple sentences in, in English, translate it into Chinese, and then a signature for initial it or chop it. And then I don't just hand the document to the supplier via email and say, get back to me. Let's do, a, let's do a Skype call or let's do a video call or let's meet in person at the trade show and go through each of these items one by one. And I also like to do it in front of their peers because um, if a vendor knowingly breaks the terms of contract, he's going to lose a lot of face to his peers. So I like to make a, a, signing, a signing ceremony something special. I'm buying lunch, guys. Drinks are on me. Let's bring a couple of your key employees and let's do this signing ceremony together. And then we go over each of the points one by one as a group. So if the general manager um, cheats me, or breaks the terms of the contract that were explained in such easy terms for everybody to understand. His employees are going to know that he's a cheat as well. So actually that loss of face sometimes has more influence than the fear of lawyers. Okay, um, appropriate jurisdiction. We had a great supplier in Zhejiang province one time that we worked with for three years. We transferred all this technology to them and uh, we, they got really bold and they started counterfeiting our product right down to the patent number. And so now we've got a product that is counterfeit with our patent number out in the marketplace and all of a sudden our defects that were normally 2% per season went up to 15%. It almost
getting ready was. Um, we've got a contract that says this um, had the, that the supplier has to respect the intellectual property. So I was having so much fun. Like, we're going to get to shut this guy down. I'm working with the Chinese police. I've got the full support of the lawyers. Let's go in and get him. Like, the day before we're ready to go in, um, they're like, let's see the contract. Oh, I let that New York lawyer tell me to put the jurisdiction in the U.S. Because, of course, that lawyer wants to make money if it ever goes to court. What he didn't tell me was that uh, a win in a U.S. court has no jurisdiction in China. There's no, like, extradition treaty or anything like that. So even if you were to win a court case in Australia because you're, you're first, how are you going to get that Chinese supplier that knows you want to sue him to come to Australia? to come to your court system. It's not going to happen. So in the case that I was talking about with counterfeiting, we basically went quiet for two years, hired a private investigator, and waited for this Zhejiang supplier to show up at a trade show in Las Vegas. And because counterfeiting is a federal offense, the FBI put him in handcuffs. But it took us two years to track this guy down. If I had just put into the contract, the jurisdiction is Zhejiang province, China, it would have been an open and shut case and we, we wouldn't have nearly the headaches. One exception. So my rule, I like to say put the jurisdiction um, near the, the factory, near the supplier, but don't put it too close if, you dealing, if you're dealing with a giant factory in a small town <laughs> because the, lawyer, the uh, judge might be the factory manager's cousin. That happens all the time. So with these giant state-owned enterprises where there's a, a village of 20,000 people and 10,000 work at the factory, in those cases, you'd want to put your jurisdiction at the nearest provincial capital, regardless of where it is in Asia. Okay, um, a, a lot of us are thinking, all right, we've got this great contract, and let's put a clause in there that if the supplier breaks the terms of the quality or lead time or intellectual property, they gotta pay a heavy penalty. And so I did that at first, and the lesson I learned was that if your penalty isn't realistic, the judge in Asia will rule it out. So you can't say, I'm buying $10,000 worth of earrings, and if the supplier gets the quality right, they have to refund me $200,000 Australian. The judge is going to say, that's not realistic. So the good news is that penalty clauses work if they're reasonable. So you're buying $10,000 worth of earrings, your contract might say you get a 2% discount for every 48 hours that the product is late on delivery. And you have a clear delivery date, the supplier has chopped it or signed it the Asian way. And you know, the, the court system actually loves those cases because they don't have to debate it. The penalty is pre-agreed, so the judge looks at it and you, you, you win an award. Getting the money out of the supplier, that's another question. Hopefully they're still in business and have real assets, but that, that's another talk. So um, having the, a clear contract with clear penalty terms, believe me, it will protect you. Okay, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and I hope there aren't any lawyers from Australia in the audience that would disagree, but my experience has been when you go to a local lawyer here in Australia, America, Europe, Often they have a partner behind the scenes that is either a, an Asian person that emigrated to Australia or a relationship with a, a Chinese law firm. And the local lawyer here gives some value added suggestions, maybe editing the English, but they tend to double or triple the cost. I've saved so much money just by working with English speaking Asian law firms to get things like contracts done, purchase orders, demand letters. So there's really Thanks to the internet, it's easy to find local lawyers that speak English. So there's, there's no excuse for not having your documents reviewed by a local lawyer, whether it's India, Taiwan, Thailand, whatever. Also, a great contract under signature isn't as good as a great contract with the official CHOP. So in mo lots of, many parts of Asia, the CHOP is a, 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 it's a physical stamp that represents the company. It doesn't matter who signs it. It's like who has possession of this red chop that is the official signature of the company, the fit binding. So you know, when you have this contract, it's not just the general manager's signature who may claim to be the legal representative. What if he isn't the legal representative? That signature has no value. A corporate chop, now that has real value. Now then there's a question of is that chop real or not, and, and that's another discussion that, that, that we can have if you visit, visit my uh, YouTube channel. Okay, so now let's talk about quality. Where do, where do quality and contracts meet? First, my first tip is 
unless you're buying so simple, something so simple like a commodity, you're buying, you know, you're, you're buying Mickey Mouse watches that haven't changed in five years, okay, you would assume that the factory is going to get it right. But if you're taking that Mickey Mouse watch, and now you're adding a solar panel and you're putting some Brazilian leather on it, now you're making something new that maybe the supplier hasn't made before. In that case, you, know, you almost have to assume that there will be quality issues. So ask the supplier if there are defects, who pays for the rework. Um, in my 17 years of dealing with suppliers in Asia, I've had lots of missed lead times. In 17 years, not once, if I had a supplier say to me, Mike, we missed the lead time by a week, let us pick up the FedEx charges to send the replacements to Las Vegas. Not once. Until I started putting into my contracts that if the lead time is missed by X days, I get X discount. And sometimes the suppliers forget about this and I get a call at the 11th hour, Mike, you know, we're friends and uh, I hope you understand, but we just got this new big order from Disney. Is it okay if I ship your watches a, a week late, Mike? You know, can you, do, can you do me a favor on this one? And my answer is always pretty much the same. Mr. Wong, you know, sorry to hear about that. And luckily I knew that this might happen because it's close to Chinese New Year, so I built in a two-week window or some padding with my customers. But more importantly, I'm so glad we have this contract in place because I could really use that 5% discount. So you take your time. I'll give you 14 days. What happens? It ships tomorrow. So <laughs> having the contract with penalties pre-agreed, and Mr. Wong can't say to me, oh, let's debate what the, what the penalty term is. No, it's in this clear contract that we went over in front of you and all your coworkers at that lunch meeting two years ago. So relationship and saving face and contract terms, they all overlap. Okay, don't do this. You make the effort to have a clear contract about lead times. And then you ask Mr. Wong, Mr. Wong, boy, my customer would love it a week early. Can you ship ahead of time? Okay, now you're asking them a favor. Don't think that the supplier is not keeping score. Later, when they have a problem, they're gonna ask the same thing to you. We're gonna miss Christmas this year. Is it, is it okay if we get it in early January to you rather than early December? You know, so don't break the terms of your own contract because that leaves the supplier as an open door. Okay, um, integrate the quality manual into the contract. What I mean is if you've taken the effort to define what are the specifications, the bill of material, even you know, social accountability issues, if you have a, a written document in place, staple it to the contract, make it part of the agreement so that God forbid something goes wrong, or even if the supplier just needs to reference, hey, what's the quality standard? They've got more than just a PO that says 10,000 units. It's 10,000 units of XYZ material processed by um, certain date. So take all the documents that you have, as long as they're read readable, and put it into this PO packet. Um, you know, Realize at the end of the day that, that your supplier's mistakes, um, that's your exposure with your customer. So it's up to us to really manage the supply chain because we're, as buyers, we're on the line. Okay, intellectual property, I could do hours on this topic alone. And uh, we covered it a little bit yesterday. And uh, at last year's seminar, I did a whole hour. So if, you want, if you're serious about these issues and only a few people raise their hands, so know that if you visit um, the blog, and I'll give you the links later, we can go into this in more depth. But for now, a couple things to, to, to remember. Um, the contract itself isn't going to protect you. For example, let's say that you have an agreement with a supplier where they're gonna put your logo on their product